Assalamualaikum. Welcome to Let's Talk. I'm Dr. Anita Raja, and once again, I'm joining you on tonight's show so we can have some interesting conversations, some real life issues, some things that we face in on a daily basis. Our topic for today in our first segment is living with facial palsy, whereas our second segment is going to be about the experiences of a mother who, with a child who's got disabilities. Um, when we look around us, unfortunately, even in today's time and age, uh, when it comes to women, they're quite disadvantaged. And if they are from the BAME community, they're double disadvantaged. If we look at poverty, they're poverty struck. And I've got the liberty to look around myself because I belong to the BAME community myself. When it comes to labor, they're further away from it. Job opportunities are rare. And it takes a miracle for some of us to break these shackles, come out, empower ourselves with education, get good jobs, and lead our life with pride. Yet sometimes fate has something else in store for us. And sometimes we can be struck with a disease that can lift, leave us disfigured. Yet there are people out there who are absolutely inspirational and are happy to join us in this candid conversation. One such personality is Dr. Tabassum Malik, who's taken time to join us today and share her experiences with us. Welcome, Dr. Tabassum Malik. Asalaamu Alaikum, and thank you so much for having me. What a beautiful introduction. Thank you. Dr. Tabassum Malik, the first question I'd like to ask you is about your life before you were diagnosed with Bell's palsy. So uh, my, um, thank you for the question. So my diagnosis was actually Ramsey Hunt syndrome with facial par paralysis, which is similar to Bell's palsy, but I will explain that um, later on. Um, so my life before my facial paralysis was pretty much like any um, South Asian Pakistani a girl living in England, uh, born and bred here. I uh, belong to an educated family. Um, you know, I became a doctor, uh, enjoyed life to the fullest. And um, then I got married, uh, married to a surgeon, had a lovely 18 month old and life was going well actually before this struck. So that's how my life was. I, I was used to socialize, um, used to uh, really have a fulfilled life, I believe. Dr. Basim Malik, you wonder once you got the diagnosis, how did your life change at that point? Gosh, so it was back in 2017. So I was trained to be a GP. I had only three months left till I was a fully qualified uh, GP. Um, and literally overnight, within seconds, my face just dropped while I was brushing my teeth. Um, initially, they thought I had had a stroke because uh, some of the signs that I had, I had my left arm was de literally dead. I had very high blood pressure, a headache. Um, so initially, they thought I had had a stroke because um, I had a very strong family history of stroke as well. But uh, then I, you know, uh, I went to a &E, had a CT done and alhamdulillah, it wasn't a stroke. Um, and I was uh, diagnosed with, first of all, Pell's palsy. But later on, when they, after um, a, a day, I developed some shingle rash inside my ear, and uh, which is actually called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. It's when you get shingles of the facial nerve, which is the nerve that goes from the brain to the face. Um, and that, uh, that supplies and helps your muscles to move. So basically I ended up with shingles, which is a chicken pox virus. Um, act reactivated in my ear and that had caused this um, and th there was a long-term uh, poor prognosis for this um, and my life changed in terms of because it just wasn't the physical aspect of it um, there was the emotional aspect of it I didn't want to look in the mirror initially I had lost my smile um, initially, I, there was so much pain. I had so much nerve pain. Um, I couldn't eat properly. I couldn't chew. I used to dribble. Uh, 
Um, and so it took a lot of time, a lot of physiotherapy, um, the right medication, um, and to get to this stage where I am now, where I am able to interact and eat and talk normally, um, there were some aspects where uh, at the time, my first child, my edge, she was 18 months old. And initially, she was quite scared of my face. Um, and that hurt quite a lot. Um, there, and then moving on um, a couple of years down the line when I was teaching her how to brush her teeth. So I would dribble when I would gargle my mouth. So, you know, and so I used, used to have to hold the side of my mouth when I would put water in. So she, and unfortunately, she started copying me thinking that was normal. Um, so there were just certain things that I had to say, no, uh, Bita, you don't do this. <laughs> you know, you can gargle properly uh, without the use of your hand around your mouth. So there were just certain, um, certain things that I've had to adjust with my family as well. Um, certainly, um, you know, seeing patients again, I wasn't able to go back to general practice training because of the full time training and the the uh, the workload that I would have had to have. So I had to basically make a decision that was right for my health, for my family. Um, and uh, I moved on from general practice. Uh, but I do see now patients uh, in my own time with a functional medicine, lifestyle medicine, and um, as a private physician. So, uh, you know, a life has changed, but I feel for the better. Uh, I've got a better work-life balance now, alhamdulillah. So, you know, things th things change for the better, I believe. Like, you know, everything has a positive spin, if you look at it that way. Um, other things like I initially, because of the fact that where um, the swelling in the brain was, um, I get vertigo. I used to get vertigo, so I wasn't able to drive. And I still am a bit nervous still driving. Um, so that's also another aspect. Um, there's so many aspects, like going into a... Uh, so initially, I didn't want to see anybody. You know, I was grieving my face. I was grieving my old smile. Um, you know, if I was to meet somebody new, I'd say, oh, gosh, I wish they had seen my previous face. Um, there were so many things to consider. Um, and especially when I first went to Pakistan after uh, my, you know, after I got facial paralysis, I was extremely nervous uh, just because of the social pre prejudices that are already exist. Um, believe me, um, I love my culture, I love my values, I love our traditions, uh, but so, like with all cultures, there are, you know, social um, prejudices that do come with having a visual difference. Um, and I did feel that people would stare, um, you know, and they wouldn't actually, oh, they would actually just give you um their own advice without me even asking you know so um and sometimes it wasn't very welcome or sometimes they would literally invade your personal space um so there were there there, there have been uh, you know things that i have faced but alhamdulillah i have come through them um and uh, you know i have faced them and I think I needed to work through them in order to get my confidence back. And it was very important for me to get my confidence back uh, because I had a young daughter and I needed to be the best role model. Uh, my parents taught me, uh, especially, you know, my late father that, you know, they were perfect role models for me and I wanted to be the same for them, um, for my children. So I had to, um, you know, I had to do this. I had to make myself appear confident so that, you know, even if there are issues with, you know, as teenagers grow, acne, visual differences, weight issues, you know, she, she wouldn't have to think twice about them because she knows that, ah, my mom, my mom can do this. So can I. So that's where I'm at, Anita. It's beautiful, Dr. Zavastam. It seriously is because you don't find many people who would be able to give um, a situation like this such a, a positive spin. And it's so important. And you've told us about all the positive factors in your life. Your daughter, for instance, I mean, she was there and you had to 
pick up this fight against your facial paralysis and, and tell yourself that you need to fight for a, a positive self-image. And also you need to set an example for her, which is so important. And I guess parenting is such a challenge. It puts you in such a difficult position because you certainly don't want your weaknesses or you know your weakness to be evident in your kids at any stage in life. If you've got any phobias, you don't want your kids to have them. And I think you've done an amazing job there because it is important as a parent as well, I guess, to take this responsibility on with a lot of responsibility. You can't just become a parent and yet uh, you know show your weaknesses. You were telling us about your experience, uh, especially when you went back home to Pakistan um, and you felt that there were lots and lots of people around you who didn't quite understand the condition that you had and probably didn't make you feel as comfortable. Yet my question is, in terms of support from home, I understand that you belong to a very educated family. And of course, your immediate family, your siblings, your parents were there for you. But when it came to your husband um, and your in-laws, how was the support? So uh, with that, Alhamdulillah, I'm not going to even, you know, um, I have been so blessed to have, uh, because a, a husband who is not the stereotypical husband, he was brought up with extremely strong women around him. Um, my mother-in-law um, and his auntie, um, they are all uh, pioneers in medicine. So they're all, they're all professors and uh, gynecologists and they have been working in KPK. So uh, for them, they, you know, my mother and was, ah, you can do this. They're, they're literally uh, role models for female empowerment in Peshawar. So um, I was surrounded, when I went to Pakistan, especially my husband, because he, he has been, he's grown up with such strong women, for him, he was he was my backbone. He's always said, you know, he said to me that, um, you know, other men would have been so frightened, but he held his own. And he said, you know, your father didn't raise you like this. Um, you can do this. I'm with you all the way. You know, Allah has made us together. So uh, in that respect, I am so blessed. Uh, I'm not just making this up um, that, you know, I, you know, literally I can fight anything with him around me, uh, alhamdulillah. And then uh, with my mother-in-law, when I went uh, home, uh, my auntie, you know, they were just so amazing. They said, I certainly bells palsy, but just to educate them that this is Ramsey Hunt and they're the gynecologists, so they knew about it. Viewers, if you want to be part of this conversation, it's time for a break. Our number is on your screen. Stay with us. Welcome back to Let's Talk. I'm Dr. Anita Raja. Viewers have got our telephone number on your screen, 019-2423-1083. You've got our WhatsApp number as well, 075-85-835-150. We're extremely fortunate that on our show today, we've got a lovely doctor, Dr. Pibasem, who's living with facial palsy and empowering women in her position. Uh, um, and they were like, Tika, koi baat nahi. you know, uh, uh, we love you. And, you know, you're the mother of our grandchildren. Um, and, I, and I've been really supportive in that way, in the immediate in-law family. Uh, but um, just people who would visit or even because we've got our own family hospital in Bashawar. So I would feel just a bit because obviously you can't step, you know, you can't stop other people or staff members or um, patients staring at the doctor. What's wrong with the doctor? You know, um, so that was a problem. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, uh, as long as you know what I found, as long as my family uh, are supporting me and I live for my family, you know, um, uh, that's what counts. Um, most people I find do try and get help uh, because of the fact that they don't want those glaring eyes, they don't want those social, uh, you know, those prejudices. Um, I wanted to get help for myself uh, and I think it was important for me to feel confident. So there are always two challenges um, that one faces. One is your self-confidence and one is your self-image of the, you know, of uh, what you think other people are thinking of you. Um, and they were two challenges that I had. I think 
the first one, I think the first one was the one that broke me, my inner confidence. The outer side, I've never really cared for. I think I've grown up, you know, alhamdulillah, knowing that, I, and this is very rare, and this is what I want to make sure that other people are able to do as well. Um, so I'm not just trying to say, oh, I'm so wonderful here, no. Um, but um, it is very, very difficult when you're living in a very pressurized society where they, where people think about, you know, initially, um, especially in the Pakistani culture, women are born to get married, okay? Um, that's our, that's the big aim at the end of the day is to get married. And if there is something wrong with your face or you are, uh, you have some kind of disability, um, a physical disability, then that affects your chances of marrying. Um, and that puts a burden on your family. Um, and I think that is what I have found, um, when people have written to me. Um, I, as you may know, I have a social media page and I That's created right. this That's because right. I, um, you know, I, with the whole confidence and I noticed that, you know, I could now be in a position, alhamdulillah, to help other people. I was lucky enough. I was a doctor. I got all the medical help. But what about the mental aspect? What about the social aspect? The That's emotional right. aspect. That's um, right. And I wanted to help those women out there, men as well, of course. But there are more women who I find right to me. Um, and, yeah. And yeah. There are many, many people who reach out to you who are not in a similar privileged position. What message yeah. do you have for them? Um, you know, we only live once and there is a reason. I strongly believe that there is life is like a circle and I'm not being philosophical here. I really mean this. Life is like a circle. You will have your ups and you will have your downs. OK, everyone gets those. We were I'm going to say that I was blessed with the facial paralysis. It could have been a lot worse. I could have had his stroke. Um, you know, and I could have been in one of my cousins did have a stroke and she was in a coma for a few weeks. So I, I count myself very, very lucky. And that's what I want to say to other people that, you know, use your disadvantage to your advantage. OK, I knew that there was, you know, that, you know, perhaps going through general practice, having this amazing career wasn't going to be worthwhile for me. Allah had another plan for me. So, you know, they, you know, as the saying goes that, you know, if, if Allah closes one door, he opens other doors. And to think about that, think about, and, you know, I'm not talking about toxic positivity. I'm not talking about being positive all the time because that doesn't work. Okay. I'm talking about using the aspects of your life um, and living in gratitude to what Allah has given us. Um, that's really important. Um, I think I've become more spiritual after I've uh, developed facial paralysis, and I'm grateful to Allah for that. Um, I also feel that all the ladies or uh, men, uh, you know, out there, there is help available. So if mm. you are looking for, especially in the UK, so if you are looking for the medical help, there is medical help available. You can contact the GP. I have my social media page with general advice and information on there. There are facial nerve clinics where you, you know, people can, you know, where there's a discussion on, um, they look at your, you overall, they, you know, and consider whether you need facial surgery, whether, you know, you need Botox. So there is lots of, or even physiotherapy. therapy. Um, there's lots of treatments out there to help you live a better quality of life. Now, right. in yeah. now, when we talk about the rest of the world, um, places even like South Africa, the Pakistani subcontinent, um, unfortunately, there are no specific guidelines. I have had women write to me or their moms write to me, oh, this girl's so young, she's got this Bell's palsy, and like now this is permanent. What do we do? We have to get her married. I'm sorry I keep talking about marriage, but this is a big part of... Um, huge um, it's huge and and this is what i get the, i get these messages and um you know and uh, part of the treatment medical treatment initially for house palsy or for ramsey hunt is having steroids okay mm. now there mm. is so much misconception about taking steroids there was a mother who 
had said to me, uh, uh, had written to me, and she had said uh, that, you know, from Pakistan, and she said, I'm not giving my 20 uh, year old uh, daughter uh, steroids because of all the side effects. Um, and, you know, um, obviously I wasn't her doctor, and I said, you know, you, you do need to go back to see your own doctor, but these steroids are very short term and it's to help reduce the um, swelling around the nerve. And that would actually help get your face, you know, her face, you know, the paralysis um, better, um, hopefully. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's just a lack of understanding. And I sometimes feel that doctors sometimes don't um, explain the reasoning behind why they're doing certain things um, in the Pakistani subcontinent. Yeah, I yeah. guess, Dr. Tabasim, it's a very patriarchal way of practicing medicine there. So the doctor tells you what to do. There is uh, not much of a, a patient-doctor relationship, which probably yeah. doesn't help either. We've got a message from a viewer, and I certainly want you to answer this one. This is uh, why I have interrupted you as well. Um, I have just been to any thinking I was having a stroke because half of my face has dropped. Turns out I have Bell's palsy. And because of that, I keep getting bullied for it at college. Dr. Tabasim, how do you overcome hate and become so confident? Uh, first of all, um, I am so sorry that you are being bullied. Um, this uh, being bullied or hatred uh, in any aspect is absolutely um, just absolutely wrong. Um, I, I, I'm sure you have already spoken to your school counselors and uh, tried to get help out there. If not, there are also places where, you know, there are also GPs, that are your own GP that you can speak to with regarding the bullying. And there's also, um, you know, I don't know what kind of other help you've had out there uh, with regards to your Bell's palsy, because there are facial nerve clinics. I know that you're talking about, the, you know, how, how to overcome um, the hatred and how to be confident in yourself, but also there is the medical aspect as well. So just to let you know that there are facial nerve clinics uh, available out there if you wanted to get the help for your, you know, for your Bell's palsy. Um, secondly, uh, with regards to confidence, it comes with time, uh, but it also comes with your mindset. If you already have, if you, basically you have a choice. If you allow, you are allowing other people to, to take your power. Um, and, you know, um, and if they, you know, the fact that they are bullying you or they are showing their hatred, it's the, the way that they've been raised. And it's the way that that's their thinking. That's not your thinking. And that's not the way you've been raised. So don't give them, I know it's very difficult when you're in that situation. I, I, I'm so sorry that you are. I, um, you know, um, honestly, feel free to message me on my social media page as well. But, um, you know, do not allow, you have this choice. Allah has given you this choice. You do not give them the power. Uh, of making you feel small about yourself because it's their problem, not your problem. I don't know how else to put it, but that's how I think. Um, okay, so thank you. Thank you for putting it so aptly. I don't think there's any better way of doing this or putting it. Um, and also there is um, another very big challenge when we look at our society, for instance. Unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance. And sometimes if, if a mishap happens, if something really bad happens to you, then it is blamed on voodoo and all sorts of superstitious things. Have you ever come across this? Oh gosh, Anita, yes. Um, I've had people, you know, call me up and say, um, you've had nazar or evil eye on you, um, give out sadka, which is true. You know, you know, it, sadka is a good thing to do. So, okay, fine, and give, give charity. But there was uh, one person who said, this is probably a punishment from Allah. Okay. And, you know, and I, that just really shocked me. Like, you know, God forbid, you know, you know, why, why would this be a punishment, you know? Um, uh, Dr. Tabasim, yes. we have a caller online, someone who wants to actually ask you a question. Sure. Hello, who do we have online? Assalamu alaikum. You, you got somebody Hi. calling from Peterborough. I just want to say to Dr. TM, uh, good on her, you know, as long as she's, you know, confident in herself and as long as her partner's confident in her, that's the main thing. And trust me, I'm 54 years old, I've got five kids. 
your partners after five, ten years of marriage, they don't want to know how you look. They want to know what you're feeling inside and what your thoughts are and how you treat your kids. Not where you, not where you facially look like. Well, if you understand what I'm trying to say. And the question is, it says, it says here on Google, Bell's palsy usually, um, ah, excuse me, because I've got bad ribs, um, it um, rectifies itself within nine months. Is that just a myth? or is the, And how common is this um, Bell's palsy and facial paralysis? That's a very good question. Thank you so much. Um, so... With Bell's palsy, yes, some people, it basically depends on the extent to which the facial nerve gets damaged. Um, and uh, that can, you know, and in, in order to check uh, how expensive the damage is, you, you know, you need to have scans done, um, something like an MRI uh, with a dye put in to see how, what the extent of the swelling is. And It's time for a break, viewers. You've got our number on your screens. Welcome back to Let's Talk. I am your anchor, Dr. Anita Raja. How long? Uh, but yet again, there's still no prediction. You know, you can't just say, ah, you, it's going to just take a month. It's just going to take nine uh, nine months. Um, with M Bell's palsy, it's a better prognosis, which means that you can get back to the, the your previous normal face. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, within some people uh, return back within a uh, within four weeks. Some people, it can take up to eight, 18 months to recover. Um, but unfortunately, some people have long-term damage. Um, and it can also run in families as well. So there's also a genetic element for Bell's palsy. Like I said, with me, um, I was not diagnosed with Bell's palsy. I had something called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, which was the shingles of the facial nerve. Uh, which was a chickenpox virus, basically. Um, and that means that I had long-term complications with, and therefore I was left with, you know, my, uh, uh, basically um, when the nerve started healing, there was misfiring to different muscles. So my eye, you know, when I talk, or chew my eye closes, so just things like that. Um, so that's um, so th there are long-term complications that some people get, and the only way of finding out is to find out what the extent of damage is to the facial nerve. Dr. Malik, that was a very beautiful way of explaining this. Thank you so much for taking your precious time to be part of our show. And before we went on our break, we had a beautiful conversation with Dr. Tabassan, which was about living with facial palsy. She talked to us about her experiences, and I think it was pretty insightful and very encouraging for people who may be in a similar position as hers. Now for the second half, we are going to talk about parenting, and parenting a child with disabilities. Now, if you look at parenting itself, it is very challenging to become a parent. And of course, it puts you in a very difficult position because you have sleepless nights, you have the responsibility of raising a good human being. And of course, that can never be easy. But can you imagine the difficulty a person faces if they are parenting someone who's got a child with special needs, especially if they are from the BAME community? Because if you look at our Caucasian counterparts, it is a fact that disabilities are more accepted. And when we look at our communities, the BAME community, we see that people who have children with disabilities are to face a lot of social stigma. If you look at evidence around us, there's a lot of research that has been done over years where we have actually come to the conclusion that if you have a child with a disability, you are a victim of social isolation. And that potentially happens because when you have friends and want to go out with them, can you imagine the problems that you face having to take a child with you who has disabilities, doesn't understand anything, and then can make different sounds of types of sounds, has different needs. And of course, that affects your relationship with other people around you, which may include very close friends and family members who no longer want to meet you. I mean, this sounds terrible, but another fact that actually comes in front of us is the fact that if you've got a child 
with a learning disability, with any type of physical disability, traveling becomes a problem. Why? Because if you look around at the world around us, unfortunately, it is not ideal. It is not made fit for people with disabilities. And transport, communication, everything becomes a problem. I was astounded to find out when I did a bit of research for today's show that if you've got a child with any form of disability and want to book a flight somewhere, a holiday somewhere, sometimes you have to pay much more than you would if you would not have to take a child with any type of disability with you on holiday, which certainly puts you off from that idea as well. Now, if you look at our religion, Islam, it's beautiful. And it always says that heaven, Jannah, lies under the feet of your mother. This is the type of prestige, respect given to a mother. A mother is ranked extremely highly. And I wonder what the distinction would be for a mother who parents a child with any type of disability. Today on our show, we have lovely Jan Begum, who is a mother to a child with special needs. And she's had the courage to come forward and speak to us about her experiences. Welcome, Jan Begum. Hi, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Hi, thanks for inviting me to your show. I was very shy to come on and... It did take some encouragement off yourself to, to turn up. No, we're very pleased that you are here. And uh, I'm pretty sure that many who are watching this show are going to be encouraged and you'll be able to help them in their journey if they are in a similar position as you. So, Jan Begum, my first question is, when did you find out that you had a child who had a disability? Yeah, so my journey actually began 23 years ago uh, from what we thought was a natural birth. It appeared to have no complications. At the age of four months old, approximately, my son, Mohammed Oway, started. He woke up one morning suddenly inexplicably crying and he was inconsolable. And from that morning, I immediately took him to the doctor's surgery uh, to find out what was happening because it just wasn't normal. I had a two and a three year old also at the same time. So I knew that this the, this was something not right with him. Anyway, it took over a couple couple of weeks back and forward the GP dismissed me I admitted him to hospital they sent him back home and they put it down to uh, uh, wind um, a colic or maybe sort of patch of eczema uh, and they sent me home and uh, it was at least on four occasions I was adamant that something is wrong with him but from the GP and from the hospital having no joy and no further tests being done I would I just resigned myself to perhaps it's something in my parenting style I'm not doing right for this third child of mine. Um, and finally, at age of eight months old, we had that the health visitor came to do the to do the normal checkup that they do to see if the babies are developing at eight months old. And immediately she could see that he wasn't responding uh, to shining the light in his eyes or he wasn't weight bearing, that he should be doing those milestones at eight months. And she immediately then uh, refer, got in touch with the, the GP practice and they did a referral straight away to the paediatrics uh, clinic, I think it was a, the hospital, and uh, a specialist appointment. And he was, within a couple of days, he had that, that appointment came up. And uh, whilst he was on that appointment, the thing that was causing him the crying, which was the cramp, which I was describing, was the cramping and he's, he's seizing up and he's getting very stiff. Um, he did that in front of the specialist and he immediately diagnosed it there. And then he said, this is uh, West in, in, infantile spasms or West syndrome. So basically the form of epilepsy. So uh, from time of four months when this seemed to happen up until eight months this was happening and there was no medical intervention so where he should have had some anticonvulsant medications to control and uh, subdue the seizures uh, he went without a, a great period of time with that and unfortunately that caused what they classed as globalized development delay because the trauma of all those seizures caused um, rather than just brain damage in one area of the brain it was all uh, all globalized, and you could see on the the um, the X rays the brain shrinkage purely because of the trauma that had happened to him. Constant seizures with no with no intervention from the, from medications, so that unfortunately affected everything. They didn't know at the time to what degree, what uh, to what extent, uh, and what areas it would affect. But now 
looking back, he is now a 23 year old now, and we have it, we it's come to pass that he can't speak and talk. He can't. He's not weight bearing, so um, he's doubly incontinent. So he needs the highest maximum level of care that you would um, in an adult body, but somebody who is the capacity of a six month old. So he he's very high high. Uh, high needs, the high level of needs. Now, I understand many of your viewers may be going through something where they've got a child who's got special needs, and it might might not be to that degree. It may be to a lesser extent where it's something that's affecting just something to do with speech or be, your behaviour, emotions, or a combination, but not necessarily to to that dramatic degree. So that's that's where that's where we were at uh, at that stage. And we always had hope because we didn't know how badly the damage, how much it, you know, how much damage he had gone through really, and and how much it was going to affect him. So it was a kind of a wait and see game. And so we always had were positive and had hope. And he went to physio. He had um, various different kinds of therapies and things like that. But uh, it, as he went through adolescence and his teen, you know, he, now he's an he's a young man now, and uh, his his level of uh, understanding and capability is still the same as as that of a six month old. John Bigham, you know, in terms of support, um, emotional support, did you get that around the time of diagnosis, especially from your healthcare professionals? So at the time of diagnosis, it was a bit of. It was a it was a battle because uh, with my, the the GP who wasn't my own doctor I just went to him because I went for an emergency appointment he was an elder he was a middle aged older gentleman uh, and he just saw that she's a young mom at the time with two more children in tow she's stressed out because the baby's crying and he was really dismissive and he just said you're probably you're getting stressed out because you're not getting sleep. And so he deferred the problem to that it was something more to do with me. And he didn't look at my son. And the hospital didn't do any in-depth tests either. And uh, uh, when it came to the eight months, you know, I got a, a, a home visit from that GP apologising. He came to us and he apologised that he'd he'd not made that diagnosis and he'd not sent off you know, for us to go for further checks and things like that. Once we were in, once we were in the system, if you like, that we now have a child who's got special needs, we were receiving the support. But at the time when you're a mother and you're stressed out and you're worried, I found people around me to be quite dismissive. I get, I got support from my family because they were concerned. They were like, take him to the doctors, take him to the hospital because it's been two weeks and he's not, he's not right and he's not settling. Um, so only until we had the official like a diagnosis, then the, the support came in from uh, the hospital, the, the various physios and things like that that were involved in his care. I mean, it sounds so unfortunate that, uh, you know, a young mother is uh, dismissed, her um, concerns are dismissed. I mean, what I have learned in medicine, especially when I was doing my peace job, was that if you have a mother who is concerned, please look at that child and don't dismiss the uh, mother's concern. But I guess it must have been slightly different 23 years ago. Viewers, if you want to be part of our conversation, it is about having a child with special needs. If you want to ask us any questions or, uh, you know, WhatsApp us, call us. You've got our number on your screens. Our WhatsApp number is 75 Our telephone number is 19 2423183. I totally understand how difficult it is for us to be in a similar situation, especially if we are part of the BAME community. So it's very important that we understand um, and stand for this cause. It's time for a break. Welcome back to Let's Talk. We were talking about life if you have a child with any type of disability, the challenges you face, especially if you're part of the BIM community, the sort of dismissiveness that you get from your healthcare professionals and sometimes how it can affect your life and the life of your family, the detrimental effect that can have 
on you for life. Uh, to join us in this conversation, we've got lovely Jan Bacon with us, who's a mother to a lovely 23-year-old boy who has uh, disabilities, and she is uh, kind enough to let us into her journey and her life. Uh, Jan Bacon, before we went on to the break, we were talking about... Um, you know, how it was so very difficult for you to get to a diagnosis because you were a young mum and nobody was taking you seriously. And it was just being said that, well, you know, maybe you're exhausted, maybe you're tired. And, and that is probably the reason why you're fussing so much. Um, however, you reached a diagnosis. And then after that, you said that the support was slightly better. In terms of uh, family members and the support within your family, your husband, your in-laws, I'm interested in that, um, and your immediate family. How is the support? Okay. Before I go back into that, I will just also say what made it difficult at that time. We didn't have Google. These days, you know, I Google mm. everything. Google is the number one, my go-to place before I even make a GP appointment and I self-diagnose and the whole lot. And you didn't have that 20 odd years ago. There was no such thing as the internet, you know. So you were relying on information coming in drips and drabs of go to the library and book out, a, get a book out. And I did not know what epilepsy, I'd never heard of epilepsy, knew nothing about it. So I was very heavily relying on the information that they were they were giving to me they were, um, and I'd have to go to the lab to get a book out early to or find a leaflet somewhere to give me some more information so I just wanted to make that point it is a lot easier and even within the main communities if English isn't a first language you know there are lots of resources that you know, can be translated in different languages and things like that so you know it is a lot better I suppose but you know there's always room for improvement but yeah so going back to your question about what support did I have from my uh, inner circle, my family network, my in-laws? The number one thing is they, everybody around us, family and friends, were really, really um, concerned and upset that something has happened and it's quite, it, it's very serious. And how are they going to cope with it? And it was, it was for us as well. It was overwhelming. We couldn't take it all. Yeah, yes, absolutely. It was very overwhelming um, for my family as well, but they're very supportive still to this day. But I tend not to ask them for help because I feel they can't do the job that I'm doing. So I, I don't really ask them, but I know that they're there and they've got every good intention to, you know, the will to help me if I ever ask for it. You're ever so brave not to be asking for help. Uh, I mean, um, another aspect of... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I just feel that you probably worry about your child, his needs, and, and probably think that you would fit best to his needs. And that probably is something that's on the back of your mind. In terms of sort of help, respite care, were you offered any of that when uh, your child was diagnosed? Yes. We were. Um, we didn't. We didn't take up the offer of respite care whilst he was quite young. Um, but once he got to like uh, nine years old, ten years old, and there were places like I had my other children, and they wanted to go for days out, and there were places that weren't accessible or suitable to take him or to take his his wheelchair or like a, the cinema where he wouldn't want to sit down and watch the movie where there's flashing images that that uh, are not good for his epilepsy as well. So then. I sort of got my husband round to it. The respite care people came round. There was a very small group and we had a show, they showed us around, they showed us the staff and we had in-depth like little visits. So we gained our trust within this small unit. And because he, it was very difficult for us to do, because imagine yourself taking your, giving your child to the child mind as an collecting them at the end of the day. If your child is able to communicate with you and tell you, I wasn't happy today or um, I'm hurt, then at least you have is a two-way conversation. You can find out some information, investigate more. Whereas for us, our son is unable to communicate. If he's in distress, if he's in pain, he can't communicate that to us. So it's very much guesswork. So it's a great leap of faith to, to, to go and put somebody who's not a fam or family member um, to look after, take you know, take charge and look after your child. But we did use it and it was a good service for us. But after a few years, there were, the management changed and staff changed and um, 
we felt that the staff didn't know our son because there was a lot of in a short space of time there's a lot of staff changes so we did no longer feel that they knew our son because we didn't have a relationship with these people anymore they were they were strangers to us so we made the decision and a couple of other things because his feeding and things like that were a bit more challenging so we felt that we we are better off just doing it ourselves and I know for many other parents who've got special needs children it's a lifeline it really is and um if you've got a good relationship with the with that with that team of people who are providing that respite then then that's brilliant but for us it, it, we used it for a certain time and then after a while it became that actually we, it was like cleaning up before the cleaner comes you do all the prep first and then even while we were out we were still worrying about him so what's the point of having an evening out if all we're just fixated on is worrying about is he all right so actually what gave us more peace was just being together as a family and taking things in turns and just that's part of life accepting that we have to do things differently now. We can't always do things together as a full family unit. We have to adapt and find ways to to still take part in things, but do it differently. And when you talked about care, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, them, at we've got a caller online, uh, Jan Begum. There's a caller who's joined us. Hello, who do we have online? Hello, it's Mr. Mohammed Aslam here from Nelson. Lancashire, uh, former local government officer from local authority and experienced 40 year working in social welfare, particularly in charity. Lovely. Um, What's I, your question? My question is not a question. I'm observing, uh, first of all, a very nice, good topic, uh, special needs children, because I deal these issues regularly last 30, 40 years with Lancashire County Council and the social worker teams, I still find there is less appetite within our community and within the disabled children. Their are highest concentration up and down the country, and the community is not fully aware of that. The knowledge, awareness is not there. What the special needs, in particular in school, in schools uh, policies and special needs statement, and particularly service provider, even from the GP, and never mind the GP and the DWP when they're making decisions in terms of awarding the LA. A lot of people struggling. So I was good topic. And I think you need to get some people like myself, maybe on the Zoom, and conducting sort of exploration, understanding how difficult, and especially for the development during the whole period, and especially the education attainment for these disabled special children. So I'm more than happy. I'm quite impressed, Dr. Nita, yourself, and the lady you're speaking, the uh, parent. She's giving her own experience, but I'm talking about my own experience working in social welfare field in the last 40 years, and especially providing education support and a benefit, and also tribunals with un un disabled children on behalf, and uh, adults as well. There is a high a proportion of disabled children within our community and we need to look at that why is that happening thank you thank you so much for your input um uh, and your insightful comments and uh, jan begum um, before we got the caller online um we were sort of touching on the difficulties that you faced in terms of accepting that your life will be different have you faced social isolation due to this? Do you think that you've had instances where you have put off meeting friends or family or they have put off meeting you because it's going to be inconvenient for you? Yes, absolutely. It happens. It happens regularly and it's not with bad intention. It's just the practicality of things. I can't always say yes to every social function and invite and i'm lucky to have friends and family who want to invite us and we have a good a social network but we can't um say yes to every um every function and, and attend every um every birthday party we have to think about and our family is good because they consider uh is it wheelchair accessible if we're going if they're booking a family meal you know, is there a place for the wheelchair to come? They'll check those things ahead of time and, and check with me, those those kind of things. But yeah, absolutely. If it was something like um, 
I go take the ch the younger ones for trampolining. I couldn't go on a trampoline. I'm just making an example. This was something that happened a, a while ago. Um, so, yes, it can be isolating. I think the really important thing is is just because you can't attend one session, if you just keeping in contact with your friends and family, like using WhatsApp and things, it just keeps you in the loop of what's going on. I noticed in like during lockdown, I think that was a good example because we had a lot of people who were experiencing isolation for the very first time. And for them, it was like, oh, I'm locked in. I can't go out. It's this. And I, I felt like saying, well, sort of welcome to my world. This is our reality. You know, we are, we have to think we where we can go and what we can do not to the this extremes of the COVID having to you know self-isolate and all those things but it, it is a it's an everyday it's an everyday part of life and uh, I was thinking people can now understand what it's like to when you're stuck in the home and you can't go and do the things that you want to do. Yes, I mean, Jan Begum, you have been incredibly honest. Thank you so much for being part of our show. The time is very limited. I wish we would have much more longer to talk to. We could have talked for hours on end. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that this was uh, an experience, a lovely experience for people who are watching us. Viewers, we will catch you again next week. Same time, same channel. Bye.